Hello, everyone. You may have seen me mention on Twitter that I was on a podcast hiatus until July. And that is true. This is a bit of a special episode where I step away from the typical focus on promoting people, communicating liberty, and challenging opposing ideas to talk about the Libertarian Party. You may have heard that there was this group called the Mises Caucus who swept at the national convention, gaining all of the leadership positions. If you heard that, you heard correctly. In a recent neoliberals podcast episode, some egregious claims were made about the party and its members, and I felt it was worth addressing them one time and one time only. Consider this episode a comprehensive episode that you can point to when these claims pop up again or the same bad faith actors tell people that they've got some new information to support these crazy claims. You might be asking, why bother? I mean, after all, we have better things to do than to respond to everyone who talks trash. And I agree. However, I have three reasons why I feel like this podcast episode would be useful. Number one, one of the people making the claims was Joe Bishop Henchman, a former national chair. Now, many libertarians in the party don't care what he has to say, but his former title does lend weight for the outside world. Number two, this isn't our standard he said, she said in fighting between members. As you'll hear, the other person, Andy Craig, concluded the entire party was, quote, irretrievably tainted. Kudos on the clever phrase there, Andy. It's the only kudos you will get from me. Number three, this defamation leads to a perception about the members or who the members are. It's that kind of perception that new people hear about and become reluctant to join the party. It's not because it's true. It's because they have no way of knowing any better. Similar perception delayed my own joining the party some time ago. Good ideas are the counter to bad ones. Likewise, a well-grounded and wisely presented response is the counter to defamation of character. I'm going to keep this episode to the point and deliver a deluge of information in the shortest time possible. These claims were made in a 52-minute episode of the neoliberal podcast titled What's Wrong with the Libertarian Party? And nothing. The host, Jeremiah Johnson, spoke with former LNC chair Joe Bishop Henchman and Andy Craig of the Cato Institute. I will chronologically address clips in nine different segments from the neoliberal podcast episode. I obviously can't address everything. And along the way, I'll play a few relevant clips from other podcasts as part of my response. I will also be quoting from two documents originating from the Mises Caucus and showing a few, uh, a handful of screenshots. All links and timestamps will be available in the show notes for anyone who wants to evaluate anything I've said and view any clip that I've played for accuracy and proper context. With that, let's get at it. I'm going to decimate some bad faith claims. These first two clips are a bit tougher to unequivocally demonstrate as untrue. It's not because they are true, but because they use weasel words. Weasel words allow you to present vague claims or even exaggerate, without being held accountable. It's when someone says, people believe, or experts say. The next question then naturally is, well, how many people, and which experts? It sounds authoritative, but there isn't anything specific to really address. But that doesn't leave us without a response. To address these two clips, segments one and two, I'm going to use a stand-in since he's wildly popular with the Mises Caucus crowd and rumored to be their pick for the 2024 presidential nominee, I'm going to use Dave Smith as a stand-in. We'll look at claims and then see what Dave has said in the past about the very same topics. Given his popularity and that virtually everyone agrees that Dave's words reasonably represent, at a minimum, the sentiments of Mises Caucus members, if not exactly their position, I think this is a fair way to address vague comments. Oh, and one more thing. I'll be using Dave's comments from a 2020 debate between him and Andy Craig. I figure it would be fair to use things Dave has said that Andy, uh, or I, I figured it would not be fa fair to use things that Dave has said that Andy might be unfamiliar with. With that, let's play neoliberal clip number one. I think the first thing we have to do is talk about just the basics of what's gone on. 
I'll try to say it as simply as I can and then let you guys fill in some of the uh, the detail. The Libertarian National Convention happened, which is where the party has its its national convention. And in terms of seizing power at that convention, winning the elections for the seats on the national committee, there's a group called the Mises Caucus, named after uh, the economist Ludwig von Mises. And this group essentially has a, a racist, basically white nationalist lean to it. And this group sees they won every seat. They they won every seat on the national committee, and now they appear to be in full control of the party. So I guess my first question would just be, what's the what's the setup here? Like, how did this happen? It was this a long time coming, or it was this out of nowhere? It wasn't out of nowhere, although I'm sure some people may perceive it as such. Uh, certainly, if they weren't uh, following it very closely. There can be a lot of explanations here, uh, structural ones, personality ones, uh, you know, cause and effect ones and everything. But, uh, I mean, the gist of it is that uh, the Libertarian Party ran Gary Johnson and Bill Weld in 2016. And um, at least by third party in America standards did relatively well, got 3% of the vote, secured permanent ballot access, got a lot of favorable coverage in the press, a, a lot of new supporters and donors and activists, uh, a lot of people really excited, um, a lot of people exposed to the ideas of freedom and um, a humane country that uh, rests on rule of law and uh, champions individual rights and supports uh, immigration and supports uh, all, all the other great things about the uh, liberal and libertarian ideas, liberal in the classical sense. And uh, there was a reaction to that, where some people don't support uh, immigration and some people don't support um, uh, diversity in all of its forms. And some people don't support, uh, and, you know, they view these things as, as deviationist. Okay. Jeremiah claims the Mises Caucus has a racist, white nationalist lean, but he doesn't provide evidence, so there really isn't anything there to dispute. If this were the end of it, we could simply say what can be asserted without evidence can also be dismissed without evidence and go on about our merry way. However, as the podcast continues, all three start making claims that support this idea. Now, Joe, he does start with a claim citing a reaction to the 2016 Gary Johnson Bill Weld libertarian presidential and vice presidential candidates. He claims part of that reaction was from people who don't support immigration and diversity in all its forms. Now he says some people, which is not specific. I don't know how many people he means or who specifically, but we're using Dave as a stand-in, so let's hear what he had to say back in 2020 when debating Andy Craig and the matter of Gary Johnson and Bill Weld came up. The thing is that, and this is where I, I think to me, right, like where my mindset is, is that I actually think that um, people who are anti-war, uh, to me, I look at in many senses as being less horrible uh, even if they have some other abhorrent views than somebody who's completely respectable but supports all of these wars. So me and you might have just have different priorities. I mean, I think like, for example, I know you worked uh, for Bill Weld's campaign. I think somebody- I worked for Gary Johnson's campaign, but never mind. Johnson Weld, I think they were supposed to govern as a partnership, but that's right. Isn't that what we're talking about? The Johnson Weld campaign? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Am, am I wrong Gary. about that? No, I, I'm sorry. I don't know much about you. So am I wrong about that? Or did you work for the Johnson no, I Weld? I worked for Gary. Yeah, that's right. The Brett year that he ran with Bill Weld, right? He did. Oh, okay. Just making sure I'm getting that right. So I, I don't want to misrepresent people. That's not what I do. Um, <laughs> so the fact that uh, Bill Weld was a lobbyist for Raytheon, the fact that he was a huge war hawk, supported the war in Iraq, supported George Bush and Dick Cheney's foreign policy. And this is not just some powerless person who has bad ideas. You're talking about like a very powerful guy. I mean, I find that to be uh, like a hundred thousand times more abhorrent than somebody who has 
you know, some racist views or something like that. I, and I don't really see how any libertarian uh, could say that, say, some person who's completely powerless, who maybe doesn't like people of a different race, is nearly as bad as vicious state aggression, mass murder against some of the most vulnerable people on the planet living in third world countries. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I just I don't even think they're comparable. OK, so Joe is partially correct that Johnson Weld resulted in a reaction. What we get from Dave is a sense of priorities. The animosity that Dave expresses toward Bill Weld has a lot to do with Bill Weld's work as a lobbyist for Raytheon and a lot less about social principles that Weld may or may not have espoused as a libertarian candidate. This is the first thing that Dave goes into, which gives us that sense of priorities, priorities that don't match Joe's claim. Now, this isn't to say that members had no issues with matters of immigration and diversity. Immigration can be a hot topic in the Libertarian Party. Regular listeners of this show may remember episode 75, Libertarians on 25 Issues, Military. In that episode, Tubb and I break down the open borders, closed borders debate. The simple version goes like this. Open border libertarians oppose borders and argue that government has no right to restrict freedom of movement for any reason. Closed border libertarians, on the other hand, argue that the welfare state must be addressed before releasing restrictions on freedom of movement, that is, opening our borders further. So here's the catch. Both sides believe in freedom of movement. There is no anti-immigration side. Choosing not to open the border until after the matter of welfare is resolved, or at least under some semblance of control, is not the same as some people don't or, quote, don't like immigration. It's a dishonest characterization. And speaking of those, let's move on to segment two. In segment two, in this clip, Joe goes on to uh, bring up the 2017 Charlottesville incident and white nationalism. So let's go ahead and take a listen and see what he has to say. Uh, How about that? It kind of culminated, I guess, after uh, my predecessor as chair condemned what happened in Charlottesville. Uh, the, the white supremacist gathering was there. And there was a reaction to that where people thought the Libertarian Party shouldn't be condemning um, these people. And, uh, and that's when this caucus was formed after that in reaction to that with the goal of, of changing the party so that it wasn't um, opposing these kinds of things. Again, let's listen to what Dave has to say about the Charlottesville white nationalist, the alt-right, and white, na white nationalism in general. Now, I will say this. It is my understanding that the timeline of the creation of the caucus and the Charlottesville incident are relatively close. But just because the timeline is close doesn't mean that one begat the other, okay? Doesn't mean that one is the cause of the other. But let's go ahead and we're going to listen to what Dave has to say on this matter, because I think he's going to tell us something kind of interesting. From my perspective, the alt-right is essentially over. I don't really think it exists. They kind of had their big moment in 2017 when about 200 people had a march there were the, or a, an event there was a counter protest it became violent it was a shit show most of america decided they didn't want any part of it and it was pretty much dead the next year when they came back and 12 people got laughed out of that rally now it's it's the reason why the alt right is even a thing why it's this boogeyman why why people like andy use it, it is for the same reason that the corporate press hillary clinton people like that use it as a term it's because it's a good way to slander your opponents the only reason why the alt right even rose to national prominence is because it was a perfect tool for the corporate press to demonize Trump. They were like, yes, yeah, see, this is the Trump supporters. The truth is, these were people who did not have a lot of influence. Uh, Christopher Cantwell had a, had a tiny podcast, a, a, a tenth of the size of the audience that I have. I'm sure a smaller uh, audience than what you have, Mark. Uh, so. To, this day, to this day, Tom Woods has more followers than Richard Spencer does. But there's a reason why guys like us aren't you know, national figures, because we don't really suit the narrative that the corporate press is going for. Now, if you're just going to say that alt-right means 
a dissident right winger, or it means, uh, what did you say, illiberal uh, populist? I, I mean, I certainly wouldn't, I don't know what you mean by illiberal. We'd have to get into that a little bit more. But the idea that I'm, I'm alt-right is ridiculous. Uh, most people associate that term at this point with white nationalists. I've never in any sense promoted white nationalism. I think it's uh, frankly, a retarded idea that is uh, uh, irrelevant and never going to happen and evil, um, at least evil if it's relying on government force, which I assume it is. All right. So Dave lumps in the alt-right and white nationalists as being basically one and the same. And then second, he says that there are so few in number, they don't matter. Again, Joe uses this weasel language saying, quote, there was a reaction to that uh, there was a reaction to that where people thought the Libertarian Party should not be condemning these people, end quote. Anyone listening would be wise to ask what people and how many. The listener is left to assume that whoever these people are were members of the party, remain so, and are in significant numbers to matter. But as Dave said, they're not in significant numbers to matter outside of the party. Why would they be in significant numbers inside of the party? But then again, Dave also pointed out, or he also condemned the Charlottesville white nationalists using words like violent, over, retarded, a shit show, and evil. And then he goes on to talk about numbers being so small, they don't matter, having only gotten attention because the corporate press gave it to them. Now, this is one of the reasons that I wanted to use Dave as a stand-in, because if the Mises Caucus really likes Dave, and this is how he's talking about white nationalists, it doesn't make sense. I want to point out, I want to point something interesting out here as well. People who claim that they found the alt-right and white nationalists under every rock they turn over are the same people who will very often, when challenged on their own views, refuse to engage. They'll say things along the line of, I'm not dignifying this small, uh, I'm not dignifying this as a legitimate claim by responding. And this is Dave's point. This small group who horrified the entire nation and ensured that nobody would want anything to do with them were given a voice by the same crowd who frequently decides whose voice is worth dignifying. Dave Smith and Tom Woods both have audiences that dwarf any of the names that you'll hear, yet they're not the ones getting corporate press attention. Now that we're done with that segment, let's move on to addressing some more specific claims and see what the evidence says. We're going to get away from using Dave as a stand-in, and now we're going to start getting into more specific things. So let's jump on over to segment three, and we're going to see what we find. It, it, the, the basic gist of it is going to be familiar to anybody who's on political Twitter and has seen um, the kind of anti-wokeness crusaders is, is, you know, how they themselves probably prefer to define it. Um, where, you know, if you, if you do a rainbow flag for pride, that's, that's too woke. If you say black lives matter, that's, that's too woke. Um, so that's very, uh, even, you know, whatever pretense, you know, these are not people who really care about marginal utility and the subjective theory of value um in spite of the mises name um what they're what they're really focused on is you know the libertarian party and and most of the libertarian movement had always been very proud that we're we're socially liberal um we were accepting of and advocating gay equality decades before mainstream politics um and that sort of thing uh where where we were we were all eager uh for for criminal justice reform when, when the George Floyd protest happened and that sort of thing. Um, the party was pro-choice until a few days ago when they changed that. Um, so I, I think if you're trying to understand kind of the real big energy focus, just kind of imagine all the right-wing podcasters you know that like to rant about um, how cultural Marxism is... is you know, and wokeness is destroying America. And it's basically that. I want to fill in some detail here just so that people don't get the impression that this is like, oh, well, you know, there's some libertarians who are woke and there's some who think wokeness goes too far. Because I think that's almost, that's almost being too kind to them. 
to say, oh, well, this is about libertarians who don't like putting a pride flag in there. You know, they think that's pandering and it, it, it's a little more than that. So I'm I'm just going to list out some uh, some some details. The Mises Caucus has a website that has has articles that offer these weird soft pedaled defenses of Hitler in the 1930s. And talk about how Hitler just wanted to be a, a great man, like uh, like Otto von Bismarck or whatever. So, Andy references political Twitter, or as we like to call it, Liberty Twitter. Liberty Twitter is effectively this large, non-specific group of Twitter users who are either connected to each other or frequently cross paths. I'm going to give them a little bit credit where credit is due. Liberty Twitter does have a tendency to be hostile to things they regard as woke, and sometimes they get carried away either by overlabeling or the so-called shit posting. This is where you'll find many of the offensive memes and comments. But Andy leaves out two critical pieces. Number one, there's actually a heavy amount of debate on Liberty Twitter, even among people who seemingly share ideological views. And number two, that debate is often more about how the conversation should happen and even the extent of it, not so much the content itself. And much of that reflects people's worldview of where they believe we are as a society and what role the government may or may not have. It's a little harder to present evidence here, considering I'm talking about a whole entire community of loosely related people and their interaction over time. But what I really want to get to is when the host, Jeremiah, says, quote, the Mises Caucus has a website that has these articles that offer these weird, soft pedaled defenses of Hitler and how he just wanted to be a great man, end quote. That's what he said. Well, turns out the specific article that Jeremiah is talking about is titled Rethinking the Good War. It's written by Lawrence M. Vance. I'm not particularly familiar with this author, so I can't say anything about him, good or bad. I only know about this article because I saw a screenshot of exactly what Jeremiah was referencing um, pop up on Twitter, so I happened to look it up. The entire article is over 12,000 words. Jeremiah focuses on just about over 100 of those words to suggest the article is a defense of Hitler. But as we'll see, it isn't. The article challenges the necessity of the United States involving itself in World War II. I'm not going to get into any of that. Again, it's 12,000 words, and I'm simply not well-read enough to speak competently on historical foreign policy. What I can do is show that the very same article cited by Jeremiah, the neoliberal host, and uncontested by either of his two guests, condemns Hitler, his actions, and that of the Nazi regime rather than defend it. So let's go ahead. I'm going to put this up on the screen and we're going to see exactly what it says. So here's here's the portion first that Jer- Jeremiah is referring it, to. It, the, the basic gist of Oops. it is going to be familiar. All right, let's, let's just do this right. Okay, so now we've got it up on screen. So here's what it says. I'm going to read it out loud in case anybody's not paying attention visually. Hitler never want, quoting, Hitler never wanted war with Britain. He wanted absolute power in Germany. He wanted to be a great German historical figure like Bismarck. He wanted to overturn the injustices of the Versailles Treaty. He wanted to restore German lands and people. He wanted to enlarge the German Empire to the east. He wanted to cleanse Germany of Jews and other inferior races. He wanted to destroy Bolshevism. He wanted Germany to achieve economic self-sufficiency in Europe. Whether these things were right or wrong is immaterial. Hitler never wanted war with Britain and certainly not with the United States, end quote. Okay, so now what we've got here is it's a matter of historical record of what Hitler wanted and didn't want, or at least people that are interested can go and look that up. That is beyond the scope of this podcast. I'm only addressing whether or not Jeremiah's very specific claim that Mises Caucus has articles that are defending Hitler stands on its own two feet. So what I want to do now is I want to put up on the screen another screenshot from the very same article. And I want to read that to you. Now, this screenshot is only a couple of paragraphs away. It's actually a couple of paragraphs above what Jeremiah uh, was referencing. Okay. And as I read, it talks about the same things that Jeremiah mentioned. Okay. So here's what we've got on the screen. It says, quote, like Pearl Harbor, it's time to rethink Hitler. Now, 
there are many things about Hitler that don't need rethinking. The evils of Hitler and Nazism are beyond dispute. Fascism, militarism, racism, anti-Semitism, forced labor, death camps, gruesome medical experiments, murder, genocide, theft, book burning, lies, propaganda, brutal su suppression of dissent, deliberately targeting of civ civilians, horrendous destruction of property, tremendous violations of civil rights, the invasion, conquest, and occupation of other countries, etc., etc., etc. Still, without excusing any of the horrors of Hitler's regime, the questions remain about the necessity of fighting against Hitler, the wisdom of allying with Stalin, the tactics of the U.S. military, the conduct of U.S. troops, and the activities of Roosevelt that moved the country toward war, end quote. So the exact same article, just a few paragraphs prior to the portion that Jeremiah references, I think it's fair to say that he either didn't read any of the article, that is, he's ignorant of what the article actually has to say, or worse, he deliberately chose to ignore the long list of evils enumerated about Hitler and Nazism that the very article condemns and confirms just a few paragraphs prior. But Jeremiah is not done with false claims. We move in to segment four, and let's see what he says here. Their, their preferred presidential candidate, uh, a comic named Dave Smith, is basically an open white nationalist who says that he thinks it's a scientific fact that blacks are genetically less intelligent than other races. Um, he uses transphobic slurs that I'm not going to repeat here, but he basically says all transphobic or all trans people are liars. Their identity is a lie. And he calls them the slur that you're probably thinking of. Um, he, he goes around with a list of who's who on the alt-right, like Stefan Molyneux and Nick Fuentes and Richard Spencer and Gavin McInnes and all of the all, all the podcast alt-right that, that you're probably thinking of. So there's real like open white nationalism here and just bigotry of, of all kinds. And and this is the group that we're talking about, right? This is it's not just, oh, well, some libertarians think that it's really weird how woke people are. OK, so you can see now why I chose to use Dave as a stand in because they kind of are. He literally said this is the group that people have chose to throw their hat in with. Now, since this claim is leveled directly at Dave, his words are no longer needed as a stand-in for vague accusations, but instead a direct rebuttal of the claim. And it turns out that the same debate with Andy Craig is where we'll find it. In the debate, Andy repeatedly accuses Dave of saying black people are uh, that, that of saying that Dave believes black people are genetically have lower IQs. So let's hear what Dave says in response to Andy regarding that very same accusation. So here we are. In Boom. terms, as far as the race and IQ stuff goes, if you actually listen to what I said, I took about as, as uncontroversial a position on it as you could. I basically <laughs> said, okay, I basically said, look, there has been a lot of scientific data that shows that there are different IQs amongst different racial groups. And I don't really know what causes that. And I actually spoke off podcast to one uh, expert, like a legit expert uh, in the subject. She's a, a uh, psychoanalyst, one of the most respected psychoanalysts in New York City, a professor at Columbia, and uh, she specializes in childhood development. And mm -hmm. she basically told me and broke it down for me that she goes, the truth is we really don't know exactly what leads to IQ and environment has a huge, huge, uh, uh, is a huge factor. Um, and, and we really don't know exactly why there are these disparities amongst uh, uh, different groups. And my guess would be that uh, environment has a lot to do with it. And so as a libertarian, I really think what we should focus on are the policies that we know will make these things better, um, uh -huh. namely to end the war on drugs, end the welfare state, uh, and, and you know, the, basically down the libertarian line. Now, maybe Jeremiah got his facts wrong. Maybe he heard about this race and IQ thing from someone who also heard it from someone else so on and so forth, and the end of the result of that chain was simply bad information. 
But Andy knew because Andy had the debate with Dave and brought it up multiple times. You don't hear him bringing it up multiple times. I didn't play the whole thing. But if you watch the episode or listen to the episode, you'll hear that he brings it up several times. And at one point, Dave finally addresses it. Yet, during this podcast episode, Andy made no attempt to correct Jeremiah or even suggest that Dave's position was that IQ differences were likely related to environment, environmental factors and that environmental factors were something the Libertarian Party could reasonably fight to improve. Now, I don't have the re, uh, reference for Dave using transphobic slurs. Unlike Jeremiah, I will tell you the word that I believe he's referring to, which is tranny. And it is my understanding that Dave has in fact used that word and that he has also said something to the effect of calling them liars and um, somewhere along that line. I cannot support or oppose what he said because I don't have the source readily available. But I don't condemn someone on the mere basis of saying a word or necessarily for communicating an idea that I may not like, even if it's done in an offensive way. People that do that simply don't grow. But fine, we'll give it to the host that Dave said tranny and then suggested their, or even outright said their existence was a lie, which I presume to reflect a position on whether or not there are more than two genders. I do want to address this open white nationalism statement. Jeremiah says, here's the quote, there's real open white nationalism. Okay, it's an exact quote what he said. I've just shown that he was wrong about Dave Smith's position on blacks and IQ. And that's according to Dave's own words. And before that, we saw that he fabricated how the Mises caucus views Hitler by ignoring an entire paragraph that condemns Hitler and the Nazis as evil. But here, this is the interesting part. He says, open white nationalism. I want you to think about that for a moment. If someone says they are openly gay, what does that mean? If someone says they are openly trans, what does that mean? The word openly is a very common term used by members of minority communities to describe how socially acceptable it is for them to disclose their identity to their fellow to their peers. By using this term, Jeremiah suggests that Dave is A, a white nationalist, but without evidence, and then B, that he is open about it despite having criticized the movement and its ideas. This is important to point out because people who use these terms do so at their convenience, not as a matter of intellectual honesty. If we cannot trust Jeremiah to use a simple word like openly in a consistent manner, why should we trust him when he uses words and phrases like white nationalist, racist, and bigot, among others? But enough about Dave. Let's jump in to segment five and discuss members because there's, there's some interesting things that are said about the members. I'll also say that I don't think most of the supporters of this group um, have really understood like that's what this is about. I mean, there's a Confederate apologia component. There's a, uh, you know, hurt trans people uh, component of it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff there. Um, I think there are a lot of people that think it really is just about Austrian economics and get lured in that way and don't really know what they're supporting. And there's a lot of people who are at this recent convention that, that people have told me, I was not there, but people told me um, that, uh, you know, they were just there to follow orders and, and vote as they were told and didn't really even understand what they were doing or why. You know, I was hoping that maybe they just didn't like Dave and they were having trouble being objective with him in particular, but they would do much better with the members. Well, not so much. I'm going to address the hurt trans people comment in a moment. More on There's more on that in a bit. According to Joe, a large number of Mises caucus members were just there to follow orders and vote as they were told. Of course, he wasn't there. And as he admits, that's what other people told him. So he's making an accusation based on somebody else, somebody else's words. Evidence again shows otherwise. In the days leading up to Reno, anti-Mises members started posting a document titled Full MC Strategic Plan. It's a 70-page document that outlines items that they intend to vote on and other things that they want to accomplish. 
why they uh, it also includes why they believe that certain votes are necessary and even cites things like Robert's Rules of Order, Libertarian Party bylaws and other governing documents. I want to show you one as an example. And this example comes from page four and is about removing the chair. So let's pull that up real quick and we'll see what that says. All right, there we have it on screen. And let's see, I don't have it on my screen. Give me just a second so I can take a nice good old look at it. All right, so here it says replacing the convention chair. It says this, in ideal circumstances, this will not need to be done until after the credentialing report. If you don't know what credentialing is, by the way, that's just where they verify who is there, who's a valid member to uh, vote on all the matters. However, if the chair becomes particularly recalcitrant, we can and will need to do it during credentialing. If the chair behaves herself, we will not need to do this. The basis for our removal of the chair has to do with her being improperly named chair per the bylaws, Robert's Rules, and the party parliamentarian in the aftermath of Joe Bishop Henchman stepping down as the rules state that the vice chair, Ken Mullman, ought to have automatically ascended into the chairmanship due to the scenario not being properly laid out in the bylaws, thus defaulting to Robert's Rules, which says the vice chair automatically ascends. Bylaws Article 16, Robert's Rules of Order 4728 and 5632. So it's not necessary that you agree with the reasoning here. All I'm doing is showing you that the Mises Caucus did put in the effort into informing its members of what they were doing, why, and how the process should be properly executed. Now, if you've heard the whole podcast, then you know that Joe points out early on that this takeover did not happen overnight, and it's correct. It, re it required reaching out to people, getting them involved, having those people attend state conventions, then get elected to state positions, and then eventually being voted as delegates to represent their states. Had the Mises Caucus found a bunch of dummies to be warm bodies who would vote without question, this would have never worked. Furthermore, on the matter of the vice chair, there was actually a split. The leadership initially supported Eric Rodsep, while many of the members were divided and were supporting Joshua Smith. Who ended up, and Joshua Smith ended up winning that seat. But the original delegate vote was almost 50-50 between the two. And Angela McArdle, the newly elected chair, highly supported by the supposed Stepford Caucus members, gave a speech in support of Eric over Josh. It is true that members voted virtually the same on most things. That's because they chose to. And while you can make the argument that many were not familiar with the details of parliamentary procedure, it's common among many delegates, Mises or not. So it's really absurd to suggest that they were simply robotic voters by decree. But you know what? Okay. Maybe they just don't like Dave Smith, and maybe they misunderstood who the members were and what they knew. Maybe, maybe these three will do better on what we can all see in here. Let's move to segment six, the booing of Justin Amash. This next clip discusses the reception that former Congress member Justin Amash received for his keynote speech. So let's go ahead and roll that clip. One of the things I found really interesting and, and funny at the convention, there's a video you can find on YouTube where Justin Amash, he was at the convention and he started reading out a bunch of quotes about how we need a cosmopolitan internationalist order that respects all people. And, you know, it's very like kind of free love and hippie sounding. Um, and it's at, you could call it hippie libertarianism almost. And it's peace, love, international cooperation, blah, blah, blah. And he was getting some boos and some jeers. And then he revealed that all of the quotes were actually from Ludwig von Mises. And uh, just basically trying to troll this group of, of, of trolls, I guess. This one is interesting because it, in, it ignores two major things. The first is, after reading those quotes, for which there was some booing and uh, there was some booing, uh, he revealed that they all came from Mises. That is correct. But Justin also says this, quote, like you, I find a lot of those quotes questionable. Well, that's weird. So, so these guys are having a laugh. Ha ha ha, Justin just trolled the trolls. But he didn't. 
he actually agreed with the audience to some degree that some of those quotes were questionable. You, you know what? You know what? Let's 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 show the clip because I think it's worth hearing. I think I think that clip is definitely worth hearing. So let's let's take a peek. Watch this. Now I'll let you know that those are quotes by Ludwig von Mises. All of them. Every single one of those quotes is from Mises, one of my heroes. Fair amount of laughter there. In this book, liberalism. That's just one book. There are other quotes that are good too. And I bring this up because, like you, I find a lot of those quotes questionable. And the point I'm trying to make is, I think we are often too quick to judge each other. Well, how about that? Amash concludes his alleged trolling of people to tell us we judge each other too quickly. Apparently, Jeremiah, Joe, and Andy missed that part of the speech. But the second thing they ignore, ignored is what happened before and after. The video from the event focuses on Justin, so we, don't, we only have audio to go on, but I think it's sufficient. Um, we won't be able to see what I'm about to tell you. This clip shows, um, this next clip shows right as he was introduced and then after he concluded. So since we're looking at Amash, you won't be able to see the audience. So what I want you to do is I want you to listen very carefully and tell me what you hear. Um, the moment many, many of us, hopefully all of us have been waiting for this, this afternoon. So now let's go out and make libertarian ideas win. Thank you for having me here. Justin received a standing ovation before and after his speech. To offer an additional bit of evidence, here is a screenshot from my Facebook page. All during the convention, I was updating both Twitter and Facebook with real-time reporting of things as they were happening. In this screenshot, you can see that I hovered over the timestamp so that we know that I, that I didn't add it later for the purposes of this podcast. So let's go ahead and take a look at that, and we'll see. We'll, we'll see the evidence here. All right, so let me pull this big this big screen up again. So here, here I am. I'm saying Justin Amash keynote. He was moderately booed when recalling having once run as a Republican, but took it like a libertarian champ. Then I followed up. By the way, Amash got a standing applause. I don't know. Why did I say that? I should have said ovation. Come on, guy. Jeez. He got a standing applause before and after speaking. So not necessarily hostile. And you can see the timestamp there. Friday, May 27th, 2022 at 6.41 p.m. So clearly, clearly they've misrepresented the reception that the audience gave Justin Amash. All three of them did. But you know what? Okay, they weren't there and maybe they didn't catch that in their zeal to own themselves. But surely, surely they reported on what they could read correctly, right? Like, say, blank changes? Well, let's move on to segment seven and see what it has to say. Segment seven, aborting planks. So in segment seven, pulling it up there. The headline takeaway, I think the thing a lot of people noticed is, um, I mean, yeah, they took all the seats on the national committee, um, but they went out of their way to delete from the party platform a line that has been there uh, basically since the start, you know, almost 50 years since the party was started in the early 70s, that says, we condemn bigotry as irrational and repugnant, um, which would seem to be a pretty uncontroversial statement to most people, you would think. Um, you and know, that was but, their, I mean, that was their, one of their number one, it was basically their number one goal for the platform was to delete that sentence, um, yeah, yeah, which yeah. is telling. It's telling because it's a messaging thing like that that is not actually advocating a policy. It's just stating a value 
So if you go after it, it's you're telling people who you are. And there is this explanatory, you know, they, they, they sent out an issue, you know, their, their orders, their script to all their um, followers that, that, you know, everybody that was leaked and obtained. And there's an explanation of why they're doing that. And it's basically, um, we need to delete this to send a signal, except they didn't use signal because anything they don't like, they, they say is virtue signaling, but this is, I guess, vice signaling. Um, we need to send a message that uh, this party welcomes people who would be offended by this statement, who would be put off by this statement. And I mean, I don't know how much clearer you can put that because the only person who doesn't think bigotry should be um, uh, opposed are bigots. Okay, so there's a whole lot we could take that, but I'm going to try to keep it simple for the purposes of time. At the national convention, the national platform, uh, uh, the the the, um, the body uh, deleted the abortion plank, and then the plank that they're talking about is the one on rights and discrimination, number three point five. And what they did was they modified it. Okay, now I'm not sure if deleting the line was the most important goal, but we'll go with it. It is interesting that Joe finally acknowledges because originally he said oh man the members they just didn't know what they were getting into they were just blindly following orders but now he mentions this document in this explanation but then he tries to say well this explanation is basically saying this and i think that ignores that the document as i showed a few moments ago a few moments ago goes beyond just telling members what to do right like now he's admitting it but it provides reasoning and citations again whether one agrees with it or not is irrelevant. It's simply there. So was the reasoning to be more welcoming to people who would be offended by that line? Well, let's see what the Mises Caucus actually said. So I'm going to pull up on screen that uh, that explanation. Um, I, I don't have the, uh, the the page number handy, but if you get a hold of the copy, I'll, I'll have a, a copy in the show notes and you can look up, just look up the word bigotry. It's like the only instance of the word bigotry in the 70 pages. So here it is. And let's, let's go ahead and read this. Explanation. One of the major goals of the Mises Caucus is to make sure the LP, uh, is to make the LP appealing to the wider liberty movement that is largely not currently here with us. That movement strongly rejects wokeism and the word games associated with it. This, along with the deletion of the abortion plank, will display that there are serious cultural changes in the party that are more representative of the movement. Okay, perfect. So word games is exactly correct. Remember, a moment ago, I kind of took them to the, through the ringer over using the word openly in a way that's atypically used to mean something that we don't normally mean when we say it. Joe says the purpose of removing the line is to appeal to those who are offended by it, while the caucus says that they and the wider liberty movement reject wokeism and word games. It's a signal to them that cultural changes are more representative of the group. Wokeism, in my opinion, is not a useful term, and I disagree with the usage here. Similar to words like bigot and racism, it's simply too fluid and it lacks a firm definition. Nevertheless, what they wrote as their reason is not the same as what Joe said. Now, I suppose that one could argue and say, but DL, when you read between the lines, that's what they're really saying. Well, there's one more important error that both have made and has been repeated quite a bit. <coughs> this line, quote, we condemn big bigotry as irrational and repugnant, end quote, has not been in the party since the beginning, as Andy claimed. In fact, when you, re, re, when you review the platforms since the party's beginning in 1971, we find the 1974 through 1978 platforms, or we find it in the 1974 through 1978 platforms. It then disappears in 1980 and doesn't return to the platform again until 2006, where it remained until this year. When you do the math, that line was not in the party platform for more than half of the party's history. They've completely misconstrued the explanation. After saying that everyone had no idea why they were doing the things they were doing, just voting as they were told. And then they failed to present the actual history of the party's platform. If the line was that important, one might think that two members who have been in the party most of their adult lives would at least come close on the history. 
Okay. So I've covered members, Dave Smith, Justin Amash, why members oppose 2016 candidates, the sentiment about white nationalist, articles on the website. I mean, it almost feels like I should invoke the mercy rule here and let it go. But nope, I have two more segments because like I said, we're decimating claims in this episode. Onward now to segment eight. Let's talk about state affiliates. And we're going to swing back to that trans issue that I set aside a few moments ago. But first, here is the next clip. Let's play this one. Here we are. Bam. There's one thing that you mentioned earlier. I think it was you, Joseph. It's a phenomenon I've noticed. And that is state libertarian parties, especially on Twitter. I, I, I honestly have this game, and I'm, I'm sorry because I'm going to talk about how much I make fun of libertarians on Twitter. Um, for, forgive me for this sin. But um, state libertarian parties on Twitter put out some of the most insane shit that I've ever seen. And it's like this recurring seg recurring joke we have almost, like the state libertarians are at it again. And you talked about some of the structural reason why that might be, but can, can you elaborate on, number one, do you think it's true that state libertarian parties tend towards insanity? And number two, uh, is there a reason for that? Like, what's what's the detail there? Well, your, your comment there, it's an important one that I think any libertarians listening to should understand, because I think what you're describing are those affiliates that had been taken over by this group before now. So uh, they set out to, to conquer the party, and they started with state parties. And uh, it took them about a year to conquer about half of them, and then they've done maybe 10 or 15 more since. Um, and uh, so that's when you started seeing some of these state parties, New Hampshire, Connecticut, et cetera, putting it, posting some of this stuff on Twitter that's uh, not really designed to do anything other than make other libertarians upset. It's certainly not helping people get elected. It's certainly not helping spread a positive uh, message of liberty. It's, it's mainly designed to say outrageous things that gets um, angry comments from other libertarians that disagree and likes from from people who agree it's it's own the libs discourse where, where libertarians count as libs in this case so that's the kind of stuff you're probably going to start seeing from the national account now now that this group has control of it um and uh, and I, I and i said at the beginning that i think this is important for libertarians to hear is because uh, the response that I got as national chair, who structurally has no control over what state parties do or say, um, is that, well, that's the state party, and as long as the national party isn't saying that stuff, people will understand the difference. Uh, I don't think people do understand the difference. I think people see libertarian with a blue check mark next to it, and they assume that's an official statement. And, uh, and so some of the stuff that was getting posted... Um, that, you know, how black people actually owe America being posted on MLK Day or um, how it would be better if trans people uh, were killed if that meant we'd have no taxes. Um, you know, th this stuff is very damaging to the overall brand. But now it's, I guess, a moot point because we're going to see it come from the National Party too. One of the guys, I mean, the example Joe mentioned of uh, it would be fine to murder trans people if we got lower taxes for it and that would be good. Um, that's a, a guy by the name of Jeremy Kaufman. He's actually on the Free State Project's board and is the New Hampshire Party's candidate for U.S. Senate now. There are 50 state libertarian parties. Jeremiah, Joe, and Andy mention two. I'm not even sure where Connecticut fits in this equation. <clears throat> I was actually expecting them to mention New Hampshire and Kentucky. Both have stirred the pot before, especially New Hampshire. Especially New Hampshire. We can be honest. The New Hampshire folk... They do say some wild stuff, no question about it. I believe their Black People Owe America tweet was one that got pushback from Maj Touré, a black gun, a black gun, a, a, a black gun rights activist who travels to various cities teaching gun safety and about gun rights. And if I recall correctly, they actually took that one down. But remember a moment ago when I said these guys keep failing to present what people say accurately. They did it again with this trans post, which was also wildly inappropriate, if I do say so myself. Here's how Joe recalls the tweet. Quote, It'd be better if trans people were killed if that meant we'd have no taxes. End quote. It's an exact quote. Moments later, 
Andy repeats a similar version, saying, quote, It would be fine to murder trans people if we got lower taxes for it, and that would be good, end quote. I don't expect a verbatim quote, but I think it's fair to ask that they at least accurately recall what a tweet said versus what it didn't say. If you listen to both of them, Jeremy Kaufman tweeted that it's okay to trade the murder of trans people as long as we get no taxes in return. Well, I have the tweet. Let's see what it actually says. Let's pull this up here real quick. Where are we here? Oh, not that one. All right, here it is. Bam. All right. First thing that we notice, this is, at, this is actually his personal account. Remember, they're talking about the New Hampshire affiliate. They're talking about state affiliates in general. But hey, what's a little misinformation, right? So let me read the tweet. It says, if, and he's responding to someone else, I don't have that someone else's comment, so I don't know exactly the full context of what he's responding to. Okay, but it says if 1,000 trans people were murdered every year, but there were no taxes, we'd live in a substantially more moral world. For reference, about 40 people, uh, transgender people, are murdered in the U.S. per year. Okay, that's the end of the tweet. Now, it's definitely a crazy tweet, no doubt about it, but it isn't calling for the deaths of trans in exchange for no taxes. That's not what he's saying. As Andy says, it is not saying, quote, that it's fine to murder trans people. <laughs> this, is a, this is a gross uh, mischaracterization of an actual crazy tweet in the first place. I mean, it doesn't need any exaggeration. Remember the, remember the whole anti-war sentiment that Dave was expressing earlier? The Mises crowd is vehemently anti-war, and that is one of their top issues. If you look at the various campaign videos that Jeremy has come out with, most of them are satirically criticizing our nation's propensity for being at war with other countries. That's the tweet's point, that if we had no taxes, we would not be at war. Therefore, we, could not, uh, we, we would not be at war because we could not fund it, and therefore, fewer people in total would die by American hands or at war in general. And even if 1,000 trans people were murdered every year, that situation would be more moral, and this is, this is the key critical point, because fewer people would be killed every year. Now, I'm going to be honest. I hate this tweet. In fact, I'm not a fan of many of these wild and radical tweets. And I even answered the New Hampshire group when they asked if anyone wanted to discuss with Jeremy the matter of one of their tweets. Here is that exchange. Let me go ahead and pull that up. Where are we here? Bam. All right. Move that there. Bam. All right. So here's what that tweet says. Or here's, yeah, here's what those series of tweets says. So in that case, Libertarian Party of New Hampshire tweeted out, racism is pretty much a non-issue in America. Libertarians suffer more oppression than black people. And they're quoting somebody else. Then they quote their own tweet and they said, for, uh, it, they, they ask if there's any members that disagreed with this take, they would be happy to have a public open conversation about it. Who wants to go on a neutral podcast and discuss it with us? And then they put in parentheses, discuss, not debate. Debates are too adversarial. I responded, I don't wholly agree or disagree. Some of it depends on how you interpret the words non-issue. I interpret it as not the issue presently needing addressed. Others appear to interpret it as a problem doesn't exist. In any case, I'm game, bring it. And I did. Uh, on the neoliberal podcast, Joe mentions these tweets are only designed to make other libertarians angry. Okay, let's see if Jeremy's goal is just to make his peers angry. Now, on this is a clip from that podcast where I challenge Jeremy. So let's see how that challenge turned out. We uh, we are all on the same team. I feel this way even about some of the people that like really dislike uh, us. Some of the people that I've gotten uh, into it with personally, which I want to say this is not about. But it, it always like I'm on the same team with whatever the 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 prags, the regime, whatever whoever these people are, the people we don't like that uh, don't always agree with. 
I don't, uh, I, I still see these people as my like allies. And so I'd rather have this conversation be constructive in a discussion of, you know, how we can do things uh, better. So you put that tweet out or anybody puts that tweet out really doesn't, you know, anybody puts out a tweet. How does putting me in that position bring me to uniting with you? Because I'm going to, I honestly, I'm going to feel like, man, I'm in a tough spot. I'm in a rock and a hard place because either I disagree, I don't know, or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a tough place and, and I'm yeah. not looking at you so fondly now. So, so how does that bring us together? I think that's totally good. fair. Uh, a question and, and comment. And I, and I have empathy for that. Like, I don't want to be uh, you're making other people's uh, you know, jobs or we don't want to be making other people's jobs or efforts uh, harder. Um, so I'll say two things. One is I don't think there are that many um, people except as a kind of gotcha that are like sincerely interested in Liberty in some other state that are like, you know, also following the New Hampshire party or that these are some national story that's getting their, uh, you know, attention, this, this kind of thing. Um, but more importantly, um, I'm not saying it never happens either. So, but more importantly, I think right. the answer is that like, it's a chance to talk about um, libertarians and their principles of decentralization and explain the way that the LP works. Hey, it's bottom up. We're not them, you know? And I think it can also be okay for LPs to disagree. We're not saying that, like, uh, you know, if you disagree with us or disagree with this, that you're wrong or stupid. And if you if you as you, uh, in your community disagree with something that uh, another affiliate says, I think it's OK to just be like, yeah, that's libertarians in Massachusetts or whatever. Yeah, those are the libertarians in New Hampshire. I think it's wise to really consider the difference between how Jeremy talks about those that he disagrees with and what you're hearing on this neoliberal podcast. He talks about things like, hey, I still see you as part of my team. I have empathy for you, so on and so forth. None of that was present on the neoliberal podcast when they're talking about people that they disagree with. Now, it's fair for someone to say, you know what? I don't believe him. Uh, but if the claim is that the tweets are just to make other libertarians angry, we're going to need more than you just saying so especially when the very people accused have said the exact opposite and even went out of their way to have discussions about it and say, let's talk about this. Let's see if there's a way that we can do things better. It isn't unreasonable to view such crazy tweets as great attention-getting devices. And it isn't unreasonable to say that's a bad idea and will cause more confusion than value it adds. But that isn't the claim being made. The claim, again, is that they're just done out of this mean-spirited nature to make everybody else's life harder and to make them upset. All right, it's time to move on to the last segment. Whew. I am almost, I'm almost exhausted dismantling all of this nonsense, but it wouldn't be a, a good podcast if we didn't at least show some numbers, right? So here's the last clip, the last clip from the neoliberal podcast that I'm going to discuss. Yeah. So over the past year since that happened, um, membership, paid membership, uh, the kind that you described at the beginning of sending the $25 in, that's fallen from uh, 21000 to uh, I think it's under seventeen now, kind of in a free fall. Um, donations have fallen seven months straight, uh, much more from from uh, like the the kind of pledge donations that's only off 10 or 20 percent but major gifts is down by i think it's like 80 percent um and there's just been a lot of people quit all right so what i want to do is i want to first pull up a chart because we're going to evaluate some of his claims and i want to tell you right now i'm going to use three charts and all these charts came from the lnc's own minutes now there is one slight drawback I did this legwork when these charts were going around, um, probably about a, maybe a year ago, maybe a little bit less than a year ago. Um, but they were going around all over social media, and I was very curious because people were making a very similar claim. They were saying, hey, since the Mises caucus has started to take over, membership is dropping left and right. They're running people out of the party. The party's going, you know, it's going by the wayside. So I wanted to know, was that really true? So I went to the LNC meeting minutes where the treasurer had reported and provided all these graphs and charts, one of them that was going around. And I took a look. So let's go ahead and put that one up on the screen here and we'll see what it says. All right, awesome. So now we have this chart up on the screen, a screen and guess what? 
man, it looks like Joe is correct. Membership has fallen. We see here in March of 2021, where we're just over 21,000. And then we see in February of 2022, where we're now down be, uh, just over 17,000, about 17,250. Case settled, right? The Mises Caucus is driving away membership. We need to do something about it. Except, let's take a look at a couple of other charts. So let me pull these other two charts up because these are going to be very illustrative. All right, so now you can see these other two charts. This is a 48-month span, okay? And you can see on the top, we're going from February of 2017 to January of 2019. And then on the bottom, we've got, uh, we pick up in the next month, February uh, of 2019, and we go through January of 2021. When we look at a 48-month span, we see something very interesting. There is a steady incline leading up to November of 2020, right? We can see that. It's a nice little line. And we know that in February of 2021, we had previously seen the dramatic drop. But what I want you to do is I want you to look at February of 2017. We see that it starts to drop then as well. Now ask yourself, what do 2017 and 2021 have in common? If you said they are both post-election years, then head to the front of the class. What's really neat about these charts is that we see between February of 2017 and August of 2018 that active donors have dropped by about 4,500, from 20,500 down to just under 16,000. But when we look at the same range of months post-election year, February 2021 through August, of 2022, we see that the active donors go down from about 21,250 down to 17,250, which is roughly a 4,000 donor drop. At the beginning of the podcast, Joe blames hatred on immigration and other social topics um, as being part of the response, the negative response to the Johnson campaign, which spurred the Mises caucus. And this was presented as a um, this was presented, other, other than the Mises Caucus, it was presented as a great outcome for liberty, like the Gary Johnson campaign did a bunch of great things, and maybe they did, but he fails to compare it to numbers in 2021 before compl uh, claiming a substantial loss in membership due to the Mises Caucus. Now remember, the Mises Caucus, according to Joe, was born in response to the Gary Johnson campaign, and yet in the very next presidential election cycle, we see higher numbers and a slightly smaller decrease for the same time frame between February and August post-election year. Now, it is possible that a substantial number of donors have actually left, but to blame it on the Mises Caucus would first require distinguishing between normal post-election year drops and the only post-election year since the formation of the Mises Caucus. It's impossible to claim a significant drop is clearly their fault with the information that we have. And it doesn't make sense that when the numbers, uh, when we look at the numbers and see that they're actually higher than the post-election year that Joe is boasting about. Again, this isn't to say that people aren't leaving. And it isn't even to say that big donors are not leaving. Maybe they are. But he hasn't demonstrated that, not with the numbers that he presented, not with these charts that had been going around, not on the face. The data contradicts the idea that Mises Caucus is destroying the party through donor loss. What is likely happening is that, yes, some members are leaving and new members are replacing them, even whether, whether for any number of reasons, even if it's a matter of disagreement with the new leadership. But that wouldn't be out of the ordinary for an organization that has had a dramatic change in leadership and to some degree philosophy. We've made it to the end. I want to con conclude with some final thoughts. And I'm not going to be very nice. Now I'm going to be a little bit restrained, but I'm still going to be a little unpleasant because I have some strong words here. It appears that none of the three, Joe, Jeremiah, or Andy, have the facts correct. They offered no challenge to things that they knew to be false when one of the others spoke incorrectly. They made vague accusations, misled about the caucus as a whole, misled what members did and did not know, and contradicted themselves, by the way. 
They misled what their most notable person believes about race and IQ. They incorrectly stated what at least one article of the Mises Caucus on their website actually said. They painted an entirely false picture of how Justin Amash was treated, continued, and they continued misinformation about the history of the party's platform. Then they exaggerated already crazy things that state affiliates have been tweeting. And then finally, to top it off, they weren't even looking at the LNC's own report, uh, reported donor numbers before making gross claims about the reason for donor loss. The title of this neoliberal podcast is called What's Wrong with the Libertarian Party? And the description says the Libertarian Party has been taken over by, white na by a white nationalist group. How did this happen? Having pointed out all of those errors, substantial errors, we're not talking something simple and minor. It's an absolute safe bet that none of the three know what the hell they are talking about. And it's unreason or it is unreasonable to say that both Joe and Andy know damn well that some of the things that were said were either untrue or at the very least contested by the very people they're defaming. The neoliberal podcast episode was 52 minutes of verbal excrement, slander, lies, and fabrication. If you're watching this and you heard some of these things, just know they come from sources that should absolutely not be trusted, not even for a moment. If you want to know who the Mises Caucus is, then do what I did. Go find them, stick your hand out, and have a chat. Not a debate. Don't leave with words like bigot, racist, and whatever phobe you can think of. Look them in the eye and seek to learn about someone that you don't know. If you honestly do that, I'm confident you'll come to the correct conclusion damn near every time. As for the white nationalism complaint, uh, claim, debunked thoroughly. Well, let's put it this way. All I did was show that none of their claims stood well beyond the smell test. This episode will be my one and only episode on the matter. Feel free to pass it around, clip any part of it, and use it in whatever way you need to fight back against dishonesty and defamation. As I said, I've went through the arduous task of including, pardon me there, I've went through the arduous task of including citations, timestamps, and links so anyone can review my efforts for accuracy and integrity. This episode should serve as the final word for anyone curious about the claim to white nationalism in the party. Had any of the three, Jeremiah, Joe, or Andy, simply made one or two errors, we might be able to forgive them for being a little hasty. Now, here's a clip that I didn't play, but I will put it in the show notes. Fakertarian's podcast number seven. They interviewed Joe shortly after he was elected as chair. They ask him about the state of the party, specifically the members and the vibe. He not only says nothing about the party being in danger of being overrun by white nationalists, but he mentions a very interesting event, one that I will never forget. Someone on Facebook shortly after he was elected took a wedding photo of Joe and his husband and posted it saying something to the effect of, if that's the new chair, I'm out. Might have been a little worse than that, but I don't recall exactly. As Joe acknowledges in the Fakertarians podcast, damn near the entire party joined together and went after this guy. After this guy. I mean, it was quite a sight to behold. And that includes many of the members now being labeled as bigots and white nationalist alt writers. My last comment in this in an entire 52 minute podcast episode, not one of the three men said one positive thing about the Mises Caucus or the new leadership. In what, a two-minute clip with Jeremy Kaufman? In one two-minute clip? He did. The story of people aligning with Joe, donating to the former outright caucus, a caucus that had the purpose of reaching out to, the, to gay and sexual minority communities? Nope, nothing. Not a damn positive thing. That's vile. And, you want, and that tells you who these men are. With that, remember, if you're a champion of liberty, your business is people and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time, and I'm out.